God, truly your mercy is greater than our great capacity to sin. Lord, we thank you for your great mercy and your great forgiveness without which we would have no hope. Lord, I pray for those, who, those of us who have believed, who have experienced your forgiveness, that we would not forget it. That when we find ourselves in sin, we would remember the forgiveness that you offer. And that we would turn to you in hope. Lord, I pray for those who have not believed, that they would see your great forgiveness that you offer. They would turn from their sin. They would turn to the great hope found in you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just over 100 years ago, the Thayer family of Pennsylvania decided to return from their European family vacation in style. Mr. and Mrs. Thayer, along with their 17-year-old son, decided to return to America on the unsinkable Titanic. And we know it was a very sinkable boat, and young John Thayer uh, was apart from his parents when the ship hit the iceberg. 17 years old at the time, hanging out with a friend, he looked for his parents and he couldn't find them. Uh, and eventually, when he decided he had no other options, he tried to board a lifeboat. But those in charge of the lifeboats didn't allow him to board because he was too old. He was neither a young child or a woman. So after realizing that he was out of options, John Thayer and his friend threw themselves overboard and hoped that they would find a, a lifeboat. <clears throat> John almost drowned. He later wrote that when he almost drowned, it felt like he was spinning. He didn't know which way was up until he finally found the, the surface and burst with air in his lungs. In spite of his confusion after he jumped overboard, he eventually found a lifeboat. He was one of the few who survived after jumping off the ship rather than boarding lifeboats on the Titanic. His mom made it out alive, but his father and his friend who jumped with him both perished on that night. You can imagine the terrible memories that stemmed from that night, the confusion in a teenage mind, the uncertainty. But when he wrote about the tragedy years later, he wrote that what haunted him most wasn't any of those experiences. It was actually the memory of the cries that came from the depths. Those who surrounded him and had no hope or were crying out for it. He compared it to locusts on a midsummer night in the woods lasting 20 to 30 minutes. And what haunted him was that although he heard their cries, he knew of their need for salvation. He was powerless to save them. These cries of a drowning man are haunting. They're desperate, fearful, helpless. A person drowning in the ocean has no hope within themselves. They must cry out for help, pleading for someone to save them. And this, this dramatic picture, the picture of someone who is drowning in the depths, flailing, overcome by a flood of waters, crying out for help. This is exactly the picture that is drawn for us in Psalm 130 this morning. We're going to look at Psalm 130 this morning, and we're going to read an autobiographical poem written by an author who felt as if he was drowning in the depths. He compares himself to a man sinking in the waters crying out and begging for salvation. And the psalmist is, of course, not literally drowning. He's using poetic language to describe his intense feelings. But this psalmist is more like the captain of the Titanic than an innocent passenger. He's not finding himself drowning in the depths as a result of someone else's mistake. He's not a victim here. He's drowning as a result of his own poor choices. The psalmist has sinned. He has rebelled against God, and he finds himself crying out from deep waters as a result of his own disobedience. This feeling is unlikely to be foreign to us. There are times when we see all the warnings in Scripture about the dangerous waters that lie ahead, and yet we go sailing full force into them, crashing miserably and finding ourselves drowning in the depths, crying out for help. We might feel overwhelmed just waiting for the deep waters that come from our sin and its consequences to overtake us. But this inspired poem, Psalm 130, doesn't end with the psalmist at the bottom of the ocean. 
No, by the end of the psalm, just eight verses later, the psalmist finds himself in the heights of hope in God. And, and what we must see in the text this morning is that when we are in the deep waters that result from sin, there is a clear pathway to hope. And this morning, what we'll see in the psalm is these steps taken by the psalmist as he ascends from the depths of his own disobedience before God to the heights of hope in that same God. Please follow along as I read Psalm 130, this wonderful poem of deliverance. The author writes, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Yahweh. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Yahweh, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for Yahweh. My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in Yahweh, for with Yahweh there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Please pray with me one more time. God, we thank you for these wonderful words of wisdom from the psalmist. We thank you that he recognized his own sin and your great capacity to forgive. Lord, help us to turn to you when we find ourselves in the depths of our own sin to recognize your goodness and worthiness and forgiveness. Pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Again, this morning in the psalm, we're going to see four steps in the psalmist's ascent from the depths of disobedience to the heights of hope in God. And although this is written as a personal testimony, the psalmist's steps serve as much more than something for us to observe, but these serve as a pattern for us to follow anytime we find ourselves sinking in the depths of our own sin. These are more than just steps to observe. They are steps to imitate as we pursue sanctification and holiness and restoration. I hope this study will equip you to respond well anytime you find yourself facing the depth and the consequences of your own sin. And the first step that we'll see in this ascent is the psalmist's heartbroken prayer found in verses one and two. Psalmist's heartbroken prayer, he wrote, out of the depths I have cried to you, O Yahweh, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. You may notice that I've skipped over the first line that you'll see in your text. The, the psalm says, a song of ascents at the top of it. Now, this isn't a part of the psalm itself. This is rather a title over the psalm. And you'll see this over every psalm from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And, and although this psalm is about a man who ascends from the depths of his disobedience to the heights of hope, uh, the title, A Song of Ascents, has more to do with the context in which the psalms were sung than it does the content of the psalm itself. It has to do with when they sung the psalms. Uh, the Old Testament people were commanded to make their way uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate multiple festivals every year. And uh, if you've been to Israel, if you know much about the geography of Israel, you know that Jerusalem sits high above most of the surrounding area. So there was a bit of a climb to get to the festival. So these families filled with obedient worshipers multiple times per year would make their way up the hill to worship in Jerusalem. They would ascend the hill to worship in Jerusalem. And while we have the benefit of streaming services and CDs and iPads to help us get through road trips, Israel had no such thing. So on the way up the mountain to worship God, they would sing these songs of ascent to one another to prepare their hearts for the festivals. And some of you probably do something similar where you listen to worship music and psalms and hymns as you prepare your hearts for worship at church or small groups. And just like you had a, have a variety of songs that you listened to, the Israelites had an album worth of psalms at 15 songs from Psalm 120 to 134 that they sung as they made their way to these festivals. <clears throat> and well, there's probably something to learn here about preparing our hearts for worship through, through singing and encouraging each other. I mostly want us to picture how these songs were used. They were large, tired, sweaty, dirty groups of people making their way up this mountain together, singing songs of praise to God. And 
as they climbed the hill, they would prepare their hearts for worship by singing this psalm. The psalm reminded them and encouraged them of their present personal ascent and their future national ascent to the heights of hope in God. And the song begins with the author in a tough place, crying out for salvation from the depths. These depths, this word is, is for deep waters. He's recalling the desperate and the overwhelming nature of his situation. Nothing seems right. In his disobedience to God, he feels overwhelmed, hopeless, helpless. He's drowning in his iniquity and its consequences. And it's not immediately clear from verses one and two that the nature of his drowning is that he is drowning in the depths of his own iniquity, his own disobedience and sin. But we can see from the rest of the passage that his iniquity is tied directly to this desperation. His own disobedience before the Lord has caused this calamity. But unlike the helpless cries that haunted John Thayer, these cries would be heard by someone who has the power and the will to save. The poetic language used by the psalmist here indicates his crying in this extended analogy was audible. He's so distraught that he yells out to the Lord. Notice in verse one that he cried out. In verse two, he writes twice of his voice. He begs, oh Lord, hear my voice. Please listen to the voice of my pleas. He wrote of the Lord in this analogy, hearing with ears. So here, this is a picture of him screaming out from the depths to the one who can save him. All of us can probably identify with this position from some point in our lives, if not presently, to be caught in the depths of sin and rebellion. You've acted foolishly and you feel overwhelmed by your sin and its consequences. The full weight of your choices bears down on you like a flood. Perhaps this is you now. Even as I say these words, you can think of specific sins, specific choices that you've made that have you feeling as if you are floundering with no hope in sight. As a believer, you know what it's like to taste the Lord's goodness, to be comforted by his kindness. But how do you get from these depths back to the heights of hope in God? This desperate cry to the Lord is the first step laid out by the psalmist. It's desperate outcry to God and heartbroken prayer. And believer, you have a God whose arm is not too short to save, whose ear is not so dull that it cannot hear, but you must cry out to him in prayer. Don't wait for things to get worse. Cry out to him now. Cry out to him the moment you realize the desperation of your position. It is interesting to note that the text doesn't tell us the size of the sin. The text doesn't tell us the exact nature of the sin. The author's struggles aren't exactly clear because that's not really the point either. If we knew the specific sin, then we might fool ourselves into thinking that these steps don't apply to us. But the truth is that no matter when we sin, no matter how we sin, no matter how big, no matter how small, we impede our communion with God because we have disobeyed him. So whenever we sin, whenever we have impeded that communion with God, it is appropriate to feel the weight of our rebellion against him. Perhaps some of us haven't felt this way in a while, not because it isn't appropriate, but because we've become so numb to our sin that we fail to recognize its seriousness. But sin is serious. We can't treat any sin as if it is silly or inconsequential or a personality quirk. We don't serve a sentimental God who winks at sin. We serve a holy God who hates it. A.W. Tozer famously said that the idea that this world is a playground instead of a battleground has now been accepted in practice by the vast majority of Christians. The idea that this world is a playground instead of a battleground has now been accepted in practice by the vast majority of Christians. 
but we cannot fall into this trap of forgetting the seriousness of our sin. On this battleground, when we sin against God, we commit cosmic treason against the commander of the universe. We, we can't treat sin as if it's a plaything. When we find ourselves in the depths of our sin, we, we, we must recognize the seriousness of our sin against God. And the psalmist knew exactly what his sin meant. He knew that he had betrayed God, and yet only God could deliver him. So when he recognized his position, he cried out to the Lord in heartbroken prayer, begging for supplications or, or mercy from the Lord. He cries with no excuses. He's not excusing his sin. He only comes to the Lord with desperate pleas. This is where we must begin when we find ourselves drowning in the depths of our own sin. We must not ignore sin. We must not excuse sin. We must not rename sin. We must confess it to the Lord, crying out for mercy from the only one who can save us. So we started with this heartbroken prayer, but with a heartbroken prayer, the psalmist's ascent was just beginning. After this desperate cry, the second step in his ascent from the depths of disobedience to the heights of hope is his humble posture. And we'll see this in verses three and four. Starting in verse three, the psalmist wrote, if you, Yahweh, should mark iniquities, oh Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. <clears throat> The psalmist recognized that the Lord saw his disobedience in high definition. The Lord saw his misdeeds clearly and specifically, and those misdeeds left him unable to stand before the Lord on his own. When you see that word mark in verse three, some of your translations may translate it watch. Uh, oh Lord, if you should mark or watch iniquities. That's the same root word as the word for watchman in verse six. See the, watchman, the word watchman in verse six. The idea here is that if God were to carefully watch our behavior so as to hold it against us, looking for our sins to hold them against us personally, who, who could stand before that? And the obvious answer is nobody could stand before that. Neither the psalmist, nor you, nor I, nor the holiest of believers could stand before the Lord if he were to hold our sins against us. The psalmist knows that he will drown in his sin if the Lord would not pardon it. This is what he deserves. The psalmist knows that our forgiveness, any hope that we have, hinges entirely on the, on the thread of divine compassion. If God would hold our sins against us, then we would surely perish. And we would have earned it. The psalmist had an accurate view of himself. He had an accurate view of what he deserved. He knew who he was before the Lord. And likewise, when we find ourselves in this position where we've recognized our sin, we find ourselves drowning in the depths of our own sin and its consequences, we must have a humble posture before the Lord. We must accurately recognize who we are in this equation. As Omri said this morning, we contribute sin, he contributes forgiveness. We must recognize who we are, who he is, and what we deserve. If you go outside of the word of God, you won't find this view of self from our culture. You won't find this view from many strands of Christianity. If we find ourselves in the depths as the result of our sin and we cry out to the world, the world's going to tell us that the only thing wrong with us is that we think something is wrong with us. We're inundated with television ads, movies, music, telling us to love ourselves more, to think more highly of ourselves, that we are only worthy of good. But the gospel calls us to empty ourselves, to call our sin what it is, cosmic rebellion against the commander of the universe. If our sins are rebellious, and our actions are in rebellion, then we are acting as rebels 
against God and his design. We must accurately identify ourselves, our sin, and what we believe. About four years ago, there was a man from New Jersey named Kevin Daly. Kevin was overweight, and doctors told him that he needed to get serious about losing some pounds. So Kevin went to work. Kevin spent years working hard day and night, dieting, exercising, trying to shed pounds. He saw quite a bit of success. But no matter what Kevin did, he just could not lose his belly fat. Nothing he could do. Not even keto would help him. (laughs) For three years, he worked on this problem day in and day out with no results. Doctors were perplexed. So they took a closer look. What they had been unaware of in his, with his excess weight was that he was carrying a 34-pound tumor on his stomach. There was no belly fat. It was a tumor that was on his stomach. This poor man could have spent years dieting and exercising. There would have been no real results. They would have never solved his weight problem. They couldn't resolve the issue until they accurately identified it. Once they knew what the problem was, called it what it was, and addressed it, they removed the tumor and he lost 34 pounds instantly. When our sin has us feeling this way, hopeless, helpless, overcome by the flood of waters, drowning in the depths, then we might be tempted to go about things the way that Kevin and his doctors did. We address the wrong problem in the wrong way, seeking relief. Maybe we feel bad as a result of sin, so we immediately try to fix the feelings. Our aim becomes simply to feel better, perhaps to escape sadness or feelings of guilt. Maybe you try to fill your life with entertainment or friends or more sin as you try to escape the bad feelings that accompany your current sin. He may be like this man at his weight. He could have pursued the wrong solution to the wrong problem for the rest of his life and that never would have solved anything. Now, to be clear, just because someone feels down, it doesn't necessarily mean that sin is the cause. But if the problem is sin, then we must identify it as such and attack that problem rather than attacking our feelings of desperation trying to remove those. Sometimes we might seek to minimize our own sin or or deal with it by comparing ourselves to others. But that just doesn't matter. We know from 2 Corinthians 10 that people who compare themselves with themselves are without understanding. If I gauged my ability to play in the NBA by my ability to post up on my six-year-old, I would feel pretty good about myself. (laughs) But obviously that's not the standard. And the standard before God isn't walking around in this building. The standard before God isn't married to you. The standard before God isn't walking around your workplace, standing in this pulpit, working as an elder or a servant in this church. So we must stop comparing ourselves to one another when we find ourselves in sin. The standard is perfect holiness. The psalmist knew who he was before the Lord. He knew that his sins left him unworthy to stand before God, deserving only punishment. And on the surface, we might think that this would drive him into deeper sorrow, drive him deeper into the depths. I'm in the depths. I have no hope on my own and and drive him further there. But this did not drive him further into the depths of sorrow. This was a catalyst for his ascent propelling him toward hope. Because while he knew of his unworthiness before God, he also knew of the Lord's great capacity to forgive. As he wrote in verse four, there is forgiveness with you. His mercy is more. What a miracle. What a kind gift of the Lord. Our movement from the depths of our disobedience to the heights of hope in God hinges on his forgiveness. We cannot raise ourselves ourselves out of these depths. Without his forgiveness, there is no ascent to the heights of hope. 
but by his grace and his undeserved kindness. In verse four, we see there is forgiveness with the Lord. And, and what you'll notice in verse four here is that while the psalmist is seeking forgiveness, that's not the only goal of God. Take a look at verse four. We see at the end of verse four here that the forgiving God's ultimate goal is that he would be feared. When we recognize our position before the Lord and we humble ourselves before him, turn to him humbly in repentance, seeking his forgiveness, then we will bow before him in awe and in reverence. We recognize that we don't deserve anything. And, and again, that our forgiveness hinges entirely on that thread of divine compassion and of our own work. When we see that, we will fear him. We will have a reverence before God whom we have disobeyed. We'll be awestruck that the very God whom we have disobeyed is the one who can deliver us from that disobedience. He's gracious to forgive and to bring us out of those depths of sin. Remember, we serve a kind and patient God who is not reluctant to forgive. And in the depths of our sin, we can think wrongly about this. Maybe you feel like you can't go before the Lord, you can't cry out to him and go before him humbly because you're unworthy. Your sin leaves you feeling worn out and gross and filthy and unworthy to go before him. But we not, must not fail to go before him because we feel unworthy. You are in fact unworthy, that much is true. Our unworthiness is overshadowed by the mercy and forgiveness of God. As we sung, his mercy is more. There is forgiveness with the Lord that he may be feared. And the psalmist wrote all of this thousands of years ago, long before Jesus would come. He was looking forward to the Messiah who would come to take, the, uh, take sins upon himself, make the ultimate sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. We sit here on the other side of that cross. We can look back and see that Jesus came so that he absorbed the punishment that we deserve for our cosmic treason. But he knew then what we know now, that God offers forgiveness for sins. We see that Jesus was our substitute. Our iniquities were marked on him. By his stripes, we are healed. Because of this, believers can understand and experience the forgiveness of God. We can go before him with humble confidence in our sin. We can believe that he will hear us as we cry out amidst our struggle with indwelling sin. If you're a believer, then you know of the goodness and kind forgiveness of God. You've experienced it already. When you recognize your sin and your unworthiness before him, it highlights the greatness of his love and his forgiveness you don't deserve to stand before him. If you feel that way, then that feeling is right. The psalmist points it out here. And yet there is forgiveness with him. If you find yourself sinking in these depths that are caused by your own sin and its consequences, a heartbroken prayer and a humble posture will propel you toward hope. If you've not turned from your sin and turned toward Christ, if you've not believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you've not tasted the forgiveness of the Lord, then you must know that even in your sin, he is powerful to forgive. He sent his son Jesus to die so that those who believe in him might live on eternally. Yes, your sin leaves you unworthy before the Lord, before God, but Jesus took the punishment for any who will believe Confess your sins and turn to the Lord who offers forgiveness. He will hear you and he has promised to forgive those who turn to him in humble repentance. After this heartbroken prayer, this humble posture, the third step in the psalmist's ascent from the depths of disobedience to the heights of hope is a hopeful patience, a hopeful patience in verses five and six. Beginning in verse five, the psalmist wrote, I wait for Yahweh. My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, 
more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. After, after a heartbroken prayer and a humble posture, the psalmist resolves to wait with a hopeful patience. Notice that there are three different uses of the word wait in these verses. In verse 5, I wait for Yahweh. And then, my soul does wait. In verse 6, my soul waits for the Lord. This is a hopeful waiting. This is an expectant waiting, a waiting filled with knowledge and understanding because of what the psalmist knows to be true about God. He is waiting on the Lord, knowing that the Lord promises deliverance and forgiveness. The psalmist has failed, but he's turned from his sin and he's turned to the Lord and pursued the forgiveness promised by God. He's willing to wait because he knows that the Lord will deliver him from his sin and its consequences, even if some of that is only realized on the other side of the grave. He will wait. It's not an uncertain waiting. It is not a fearful waiting. He waits with hope. He waits with certainty regarding his deliverance. He knows the Lord's promises. He knows the Lord's character. His hope isn't based on empty optimism or misinformation, but on what he knows to be true. Last year, my family set up Christmas on the day after Thanksgiving. So you're looking at about a month before the big day. We pulled out the trees and decorations. I hung the lights on the house. My kids helped in the way that a one, three, and five-year-old help, and they loved it. The next morning, my wife and I were reminiscing over the previous day. We were sitting on the couch drinking coffee. My five-year-old son woke up, and he ran out to us like he does with a big smile on his face. He gave us really big hugs and just was clearly excited. After smiling at us and giving us big hugs, he shouted, Merry Christmas, Mom and Dad. <laughs> uh, it was still late November. <laughs> you see, he knew he knew that it was Christmas because of what we had done. He, he was hopeful, he was confident, even certain that it was Christmas. But his hope, his confidence, his understanding were based on a five-year-old's understanding of the calendar. He was hopeful, he was certain, but he was very wrong. So what makes the psalmist's hope what makes his certainty different than that of a confused child? Is he waiting with hopeful expectation because he enjoys the power of positive thinking? Is he waiting with hopeful expectation because you know, things can't get any worse? He's drowning in the depths. He might as well hope for the best. No. His hope is built on what he knows to be true. He hasn't done a statistical analysis and plotted probabilities. Look at the end of verse 5. In his word do I hope. In his word do I hope. His hope is not in statistics. His hope is not based on his own charisma. His hope is not in his education or in his ability to figure things out. Rather, he can have confidence no matter what happens because God's word is true and God has promised to forgive. The psalmist's confidence, this confident hope, stems from God's faithfulness to his own word and to his own promises and to his own character. This is one reason you'll hear around here that we must go to the word of God to get the God of the word, to know the God of the word. God is faithful to what he has said. But how can we find comfort in his word if we don't know what it says, if we're not reading it? If we don't know the word of God, then how can we know why we can have hope? We might be tempted to seek comfort elsewhere, to seek confidence elsewhere in, in our own personal experiences, in just general principles. Maybe we, we are tempted to seek confidence in, in empty wishes and hope with no basis or, or folk wisdom. But lasting com comfort and confidence in trials can only come from the promises of God given to us in the word of God. 
And how certain was he of the Lord's salvation? Well, how certain is a watchman that the morning will come? And that watchman is someone, perhaps a shepherd or a soldier who worked an overnight shift until the morning. They were awake all night watching for danger. If a couple of night watchmen are hanging out really tired, do you think they ever really wonder if the morning is going to come? Maybe they feel the time going by slowly. Pulling night shift is long and hard. If you've ever worked on that, you know that you will long for the morning. You will wait expectantly. You will be thinking about that day. You may grow weary in your waiting. These watchmen, they may get tired and they might long for the morning, waiting for its arrival, but they don't question whether it will come. The nature of the morning is that it always comes after the night. The, the earth hasn't stopped spinning. And God's promises are more certain than the continued rotation of our planet. Like the psalmist, if we turn from our sin and we turn to the Lord for forgiveness, then we can be absolutely certain that he will be faithful to what he has promised. If you cry out to the Lord from the depths, then you can be more certain that he will keep his word and that he will forgive than that the morning will come. This confidence in his word can carry us through deep waters and through long nights. If you feel like you're drowning, if you're overwhelmed and iniquity has brought you to a place of desperation, then turn to him humbly and set your feet on the solid ground of his promises. Hebrews 10, 23 tells us that he who promised is faithful. You can trust him in deep waters, and through long nights, he remains faithful to his word. After this heartbroken prayer, a humble posture, and hopeful patience, the fourth, fourth step we see in this ascent from the depths of his own disobedience to the heights of hope in God is a hopeful proclamation. A hopeful proclamation. In verse 7, we read, he turns to the nation and he cries out to them, O Israel, hope in Yahweh, for with Yahweh there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Well, the psalmist spent verses 1 through 6 sharing his personal story. Verses 1 through 6 were a personal testimony of how he turned from his sin and he turned to the Lord. In verse 7 and 8, he, he turns away from himself and he turns toward the nation, crying out for them to join him in his obedience. See what he has seen to follow the path that he has followed. When he said that he was waiting in verses 5 and 6, we might think of waiting as like our experience at the DMV, just sitting around and waiting for things to happen. But that's not what the psalmist meant when he said that he was waiting. Waiting on the Lord doesn't mean sitting on our hands. Part of his hopeful waiting was a hopeful proclamation of, to others of the truth. His waiting involved proclamation. He has worked through his problem. He has experienced the divine solution. He understands it. And he wants all of God's people and all of the nation to know of the forgiveness found in God. Look at verse 7. He told the nation that they too should hope. And he based that hope on the character of God. Remember in verse 5, his hope was based on the word of God. His word do I trust. In verse uh, 7, he points here to the God's faithful character. Notice he, he calls out God's steadfast love. The redemption of God, these are also revealed in his word. This, this loving kindness in verse 7, this, this is a loyal love from God to his people. This speaks of God's faithfulness to love and to forgive. If you are one of God's own, then God is loyal 
in his love to you. You can rely on his forgiveness both now and forever. Notice the repeated use of redemption in verses seven and eight. The redemption is directly tied to iniquities or sins in verse eight. This, this redemption, this is God's power and will to save his people from their sin. And while the psalmist was redeemed by God in, in, in relation to a particular sin in the first six verses here, in verse eight, he broadens the idea. He writes, he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is an eternal redemption. Notice the change in tense here in verses seven and eight. Verse seven, with him is abundant redemption, present tense. With him is abundant redemption presently. Verse eight, he will redeem his people from their sins, future tense. Our sins present both a present problem and an eternal problem. God's loving kindness, his redemption, his mercy, mercy, his willingness to forgive, these characteristics of God solve both our present and our eternal problem. And worthy of note is that since we can trust that God is faithful to his word, remember, in his word do I trust, since we know that God does not depart from his word, we can know here that there is a future redemption for national Israel. As the psalmist makes clear at the end of his passage, we can be as sure about the future deliverance of national Israel as we can be sure about our own future salvation because the word of God holds true. The psalmist has experienced a dramatic transition in just eight verses. Over the course of eight verses, this man has gone from drowning in the depths of his own disobedience to shouting for others to join him in the heights of hope. His ascent wasn't based on anything special about him. There's nothing special about the psalmist related to God's forgiveness that could not be said about us or for us. He wasn't particularly redeemed by God in a way that God doesn't offer forgiveness to others. This ascent to the heights of hope was contingent entirely on God's faithfulness to his own character and his word and not based on who the psalmist was. If you find yourself drowning in these depths of sin and you've not trusted in the Lord for salvation, let today be the day. Let today be the day that you turn to the Lord's forgiveness. Let today be the day of your salvation. But know that you, you can't approach the heights without acknowledging the depths. Confess your sins. Recognize them for what they are. Rebellion against a holy God. You don't deserve to stand before him. And yet, you can confess your sins to him, commit to turning from them, and he promises forgiveness. The Lord is gracious to forgive, and only through that forgiveness can you find eternal hope. You can find redemption in the Lord because of what happened on the cross. Jesus accomplished what we cannot accomplish on our own. He, he took those sins on himself at the cross so that we could be seen with his righteousness. Embrace the forgiveness offered through Jesus and let his forgiveness move you from the depths of your own disobedience to the heights of hope in God. If you've already trusted in God for salvation, if you've already turned to Christ turned from your sin and trusted in him for salvation, then you've already experienced his forgiveness. You already know of his kindness and salvation. You already know of his deliverance. Remember who he is. Remember his promises. Remember his character. When you find yourself in the depths of sin, 
you must remember his forgiveness. Cry out to him with a desperate cry. Recognize your position. Remember his promises. Remember his character. Remember what was accomplished for you on the cross. Don't minimize your sin. Don't minimize it. But magnify his forgiveness. Our sins are many. Our sins may feel overwhelming, but his mercy is more. His forgiveness is greater. You can and you must turn from your sin. You can and you must turn from your sin. The psalmist has laid out some steps for you to follow if that's what you're pursuing. I would call on you to do that if you find yourself in these depths. If you find yourself drowning in the depths of your disobedience, then follow the steps of the psalmist to the heights of hope in God. Turn from your sin. Embrace the forgiveness offered by your creator and be restored to the joy of your salvation. Please pray with me. God, you are kind to us to put us in a place where we have your word, to put us in a place where your offer of salvation is placed before us, where a reminder of your forgiveness is near constant. Lord, I pray that we would not become numb to your goodness, that we would not become numb to your kindness we would not become numb to the clear steps you've given us here and in other passages, how to find restoration, on where to find forgiveness. Lord, for any who find themselves drowning in the depths that result from their own sin and its consequences, I pray that you would burden them with this knowledge, that you would help them to recognize the path to forgiveness, to restoration, that they would feel the the weight of their own sin, that you would remind them of the forgiveness that you offer. Lord, help us to feel the weight of our sin more. We too often grow numb to our own sin, what it means before you, what we deserve. Lord, help us to remember. Help us not to forget. Help us not to distract ourselves when we recognize who we are. Lord, help us to turn to you in praise and worship, thanking you for your kind forgiveness, and help us to turn to others, calling them to repent and to turn as we have turned. Lord, be kind to us. Help us in our sin. We feel the weight of them. Help us to turn to you. In Christ's name, amen.